In this episode of Retro Combs, I'm returning back to the Commodore Plus 4 user's manual for Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is using graphics and color. If you are eager to create images on your Commodore Plus 4, this is the chapter for you. Chapter 7 is going to include information on Petsky characters, colors commands, graphics commands, different graphics modes, and other ways that you can create static images as well as am 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 animations on your Commodore Plus 4. This episode is packed with information and comes with an amazing companion blog post that includes all of the programs that you'll see me demonstrate today. So you're gonna to wanna make sure and check out that companion blog post. Now, let's go ahead and get started and learn how to use graphics and color on our Commodore Plus 4. Okay, this is full disclosure time. What I should tell you now is that I am not using a Commodore Plus 4 for these examples for Chapter 7. As a matter of fact, my Commodore Plus 4 is right there. And what I'm using is the device emulator. And I found that I could produce a better image and speed things up a little bit if I use the device emulator in OBS. So that's what you're seeing on the screen. The other thing I want to point out is that there is a companion blog post, as I mentioned earlier, but more importantly, there's a companion disk image. There's a .d81 disk image that goes along with this whole series of chapters one through seven and a couple of chapters in the future that we'll cover. But every program that I've demonstrated is on that companion disk. I've typed in every one of these programs programs. Uh, well, not entirely typed them in. Actually, what I did first was scan the images out of the book using Adobe Scan, did some OCR, and then copy and pasted that into Vice, which allowed me to then make some adjustments and save it to the disk image. But let's stop with all this narrative and let's get started. And the first thing we want to talk about is graphic characters. One of the first things you notice when you start typing on a Commodore 8-bit computer is that the keyboard not only includes the common alphanumeric keys that you have, but also some special keys right underneath those letters and numbers. You're gonna use that keyboard to type and create what are known as Petsky characters. But Petsky stands for Pet Standard Code of Information Interchange. It's also known as CBM ASCII or Commodore ASCII. Most of those characters did make it over to the modern ASCII code. You can find most of these characters still in modern ASCII tables. Before we use Petsky characters, we need to remember that the plus four includes an uppercase mode and a lowercase mode. By default, as you're seeing on the screen, it's in uppercase mode. If we hold our Commodore key and our shift key and tap our shift key, you'll notice it changes to lowercase mode. That's gonna change the availability of specific or certain Petsky characters. For instance, let me go back to uppercase mode and let's go ahead and do the A symbol. So the A is now in uppercase. Now, as you would suspect, if I hold Commodore Shift, it'll change to a lowercase a. If I go back, you'll see I have an uppercase A. Now, what happens if I use a Shift A, which produces the spades symbol? If I change that to lowercase, you'll see that it changes to a capital A. So that character is reserved for a capital A and the spade character. But what happens if in uppercase mode, I use the Commodore key, hit A, you see I get a different symbol. And it's a little piece of, could be the top part of a, a table, a left-hand corner of a table. But what happens if I shift back into lowercase mode? Well, then that character stays. So that specific character can be used in both uppercase and lowercase mode. If you'd like to see all the Petsky characters that are available, check out this webpage. This is the Commodore 64 Petsky codes. However, these are the same characters found on the Commodore Plus 4. And you'll see this chart includes the Petsky code and decimal and hex. We'll use the decimal here in just a little bit. The characters as well as a symbolic version of each Petsky character, including all the special graphics characters. And of course that page includes all of the images, but wouldn't it be fun to see those on the Commodore Plus 4 screen, which is what I wanted to do. So I used the decimal character string values and I created a basic program that will display all of our Petsky characters on our Plus 4. This program is of course found on the companion disk image. Let me go ahead and load that up for us. 
Here's a listing of all of the files on the companion disk. Have I, have I mentioned the companion disk yet? You really need to check this out. This is pretty good. So what we're going to do now is we're going to load a program called 07 Petski. Now you'll notice I've done a few things here to shorten up our time typing. I just type DL shift O and then I use an open quotation. Believe it or not, you don't need that trailing quotation mark. So we're searching for that, we're loading. Let's go ahead and list this program. You'll see here that what this program does is basically runs through a loop and plugs in some values into this command right here, which is print the character string for a value. Each one of these characters we can bring up using this command, this print character string and then the value. The value comes, of course, from that chart I showed you earlier. And so what I've done is I've just created a loop that will go through those Petsky characters for us from 33 to 127 and then skips a, a beat. And if you take a look at that graph, you'll find out why I did that. We go to 160 and then we go to 255. So technically, if I run this, it should, first of all, clear the screen and then print our Petsky characters. R, Shift U, we'll run that. And there's all of our Petsky characters, including our alphanumeric characters that are available on the plus four. So here's a fun tip. You know how sometimes we'll type in an in intermediate mode where we're just, we're not programming, we're just trying things out. So, you know, print, uh, but maybe we don't put print, we put print two plus two and we hit, and we hit two plus two, there we go, and we hit enter and we get the syntax error because that's not correct. You would expect that maybe that would occur when we just type random Petsky characters. But if I come down here a little bit, I hold the shift A and I draw across the screen and then I hit enter, watch what happens. I don't get a syntax error, I get a ready prompt. So this is a way that maybe, or a tool that you could use to help prototype a drawing on the screen because what I could do now is I could come back up here, type 10, type print, give it open quotations. Now I'm not gonna go over because if I do that, that's gonna overwrite with the right cursor arrow that would actually move the cursor right in the print statement. I'm just gonna go ahead and hit enter right now. And then if we come down and list that, then I can come back up here and I can close those quotation marks and then I have a valid line. And uh, you'll see I have 20 left over from a previous. Let me go ahead and get rid of that. Let's list and let's run that. And you can see that that helped me kind of prototype drawing that line of Petsky characters. Okay, while drawing a bunch of Petsky characters on screen can be a blast, can we use those Petsky characters and create animation? You can create a simple animation by turning things on and off, right? Or by moving things a character or pixel at a time. So we're gonna demonstrate kind of those concepts in the next couple of programs. I have a program in memory right now, as you know. Let's go ahead and do that. By the way, a little tip for you. If you type in sys, three, two, seven, six, eight, watch what happens. It actually returns you back to the Commodore prompt. So if you ever just need that for some reason, if that just makes you feel safe and secure to be back there, instead of just a simple screen clear like this, know that that's available for you. Let's create an animation using Petsky characters. This is a very simple rudimentary animation, but I think it's a lot of fun. And what you're going to learn immediately is that you can change the program to do some other things. So what I'm going to do now is uh, from the companion disk image, I'm going to load 07. Again, that's for chapter seven. And this one is called Pulse Ball. So we're gonna load that. Let's list that. And now let's go through the program line by line and talk about what we have. So line 10, this character will actually send us home. So it's going to move the cursor no matter where it is to the upper left-hand corner of the screen. That is the home symbol. And then it's gonna print a Petsky ball character that's filled. The next thing we're going to do is it's going to loop for a length of one to 100. So it's basically gonna count from one to 100. It's gonna go down here to next L and it's gonna jump back. So the first time it goes through line 20, it would be L equals one, next L, jump back up, L equals two, jump down, there you, so you get it. It'll go all the way to 100. All we're doing with those lines is causing a pause, a bit of a pause. So keep that in mind because that's a way that we can modify this program to do other things. We'll come back to that. 
After that pause, it's now going to go back to that home screen. So it's printed the ball, it's moved over one, now it's gonna jump back and it's going to print a hollow ball or this character right here. So what does line 50 and 60 do? Of course, same thing that lines 20 and 30 did. Let's pause for a little bit. And then after that, go back to line 10. Now, you can probably figure out in your mind what's going to happen. It's going to cycle between that closed ball and that hollow ball. It's gonna pause between each of those steps and we're gonna get something that looks like an animation. Let's run it and see what it looks like. And there you go, you see it up in the upper left hand corner. Now what could make this program better is to kind of clear all that business off the screen. So what I'm going to do is escape out of here. I'm gonna come down here and I'm going to put a five screen clear in here. Now if we list our program and this will clean everything up for us. Let's go ahead and run it. And there you go. Now we have our first plus four animation, a pulsing ball. How exciting is that? Let me go ahead and list this. The ball has a specific length that it pulses. Let's go back up here. Let's change this to not 100. Let's change that to 50. Let's enter that. Let's go here. Let's change that one to 50. Enter that. And now let's run it again and watch our animation. You'll notice it's much faster. So you can control the pulse of the ball by the lines that are the four next loop. So that's our pulsing ball animation. Okay, let's create another two cell animation. This time it won't be a pulsing ball, but it'll be someone doing jumping jacks. Let's go ahead and load up the program and see what that looks like. Oops, I need to put in my chapter and jumping jack. Let's go ahead and load that up from our companion disc. Let's list it, and here we go. Let's step through this. It's pretty easy. If you followed along with the pulsing ball, you shouldn't have any problems with this. So line five, again, is clearing the screen. This is the upper portion. Remember that this character right here will move the cursor to the very top left-hand corner. Then we're gonna do some arms out for our jumping jacks that look like this, along with the head, kind of looks like that. We go to our next line. We're going to print our body. Then we're gonna do our legs in the outward position. So that's kind of the first cell of animation. Then, if you remember from our last program, line 40 is combining the four next loop into a single line. So we have 4L equals 1 to 100 next L, so it's going to count to 100 quickly. And then it's going to print the second cell of our animation. So we go back up to the upper left-hand screen. You'll notice now we don't have any arms up. We just have a head. So it's basically going to replace this head again in cell number two. The next line will produce the body again, but also have the arms stretched out. You can't see me stretching my arms out, but that's what I'm doing. And then finally, the last one will print our two little legs like this. And once again, we have that four next loop to give us some time in between the cells. And then we'll just keep doing this program in line 90. It just jumps back up to 10 forever until we tell it to stop. Let's try it. Let's run it and see jumping jack. There you go. How exciting our little jumping jack guy is going. Now, seems a little slow to me. Let's go ahead and list our program and let's make him work a little bit harder for his money. So well, let's do 50. I'll hit this. I'll hit enter. Remember, I can just go in here and modify these lines. I don't have to retype the entire line. It does get tricky sometimes if you don't have enough space, but you'll see if I list this, everything looks great. Now, if I run it, you'll notice he's really getting getting, getting his jumping jacks in now. Uh, as a matter of fact, to the point where it looks like it's so fast that it's not really in sync anymore. His arms are a little faster than his legs. Let's go ahead and change it one more time and let's slow him down a little bit. Let's change this from 50 to 500. Hit enter and let's go ahead and do line 80 from 50 to 500. Hit enter and let's run this again and check him out. Now he's really doing some slow jumping jacks. But there you go. There's how you can use the print command to create an animation using two, basically two cells and some paws in the upper left hand corner. Let's do another one that doesn't keep the character in the same location, but let's do a program where the character moves across the screen. So let's do that one next. Okay, let me go ahead and let's go ahead and new here and we're going to deload 07 and I call this one inchworm. And this again uses just two cells of animation, a start 
and an end, but what it does is it overlaps those in such a way that it's going to move across the screen. You're gonna see a little inchworm moving across the screen. We load that up, let's go ahead and list this program. And let's go ahead and just run through it quickly. First of all, you'll see that we've got a little thing here that says for A is equal to zero to 30. Zero to 30 is a location on the screen. Think of that right now. We're gonna clear our screen, we're going to print, and then we're going to tab over a value. So if this were zero in the first cycle, then we will tab at zero. If it's one, we'll tab over one, two, three. You can kind of see what's probably going to happen here, right? After it does that, it's going to print these characters right here. And then the next line is gonna do the same thing, print another line right under it, but at the same tab value or horizontal distance across. Then we're gonna do another pause, we're gonna clear our screen again, and then we're gonna do this character cell, but with those same tab values. Then we're going to uh, add again, inject some time, and then we're gonna next A, or move to that next A, which jumps us back up to here, clears the screen, moves everything over a character, and then we've got this little wiggly worm going across the screen. Don't believe me? Let's try it, okay? All right, let's run it and see what happens. Good luck. And you'll see him just kind of moving across the screen. The tab value, if you remember, only goes to 30. So it's gonna stop right about there, okay? So this one actually exits out of the program once it reaches 30. What if you want it to go to the end of the screen? Well, what do we think that max value is? Let me, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna do one here, first of all. I'm gonna make it 40 because it is a 40 character screen, but I think you probably see the problem here already. And the other thing I'm gonna do, we need to speed him up uh, significantly. So let's go ahead and do 50 here. Let's go ahead and do 50 down here. And now let's run it and see what happens if we go 40 because a character or a Commodore screen's 40 characters across, right? And you can see, first of all, much faster inchworm, we like that. And let's wait and see what happens as it reaches the end. Okay, so you see that once we get to the end, it starts to break up. It's pushing things out of sorts. So unfortunately, it can't do the 40, but if you count your number of characters, you might be able to figure this out. What if we just want to go to the end and stop? Well, I believe I have calculated this, and I think 34 is our maximum value. So let's go ahead and try this again. Oh, and hey, let's speed this up a little bit. There's just a little too much waiting in here for this example, we'll make that 10. We'll come over to here, we'll come up, make that 10, and let's run. There we go, that's a lot faster. And let's see if he goes to the end and stops at 34. Looks like we've got a little bit of headway to go. Let's, uh, let's see, what if we do 30? That to me looks like we can get up to about 36. What do you think? Let's try it. Again, this is part of the fun, just playing with the program to see if you can get it to do what you want. There you go. So we now know that if we wanna go from left to right, 36 for that program is the way to do it. Now, if you wanted him to go to the next line, you can do that. You would just need to change and modify some code. We're not gonna do that, but that'd be a great thing for you to try on your own. So there is our inchworm program. Let's continue on a theme now. And what we're gonna do now is look at a program that'll move a ball across the screen, similar to our inchworm. But there's some interesting things that are included in this example. First of all, did you know that you can use Petsky characters in program names? You can. So I can do deload. Let me go ahead and click over here, deload, and open quotations, 07. And the next one I'm going to load is one called move. I'm gonna shift, I'm gonna hold shift Q, and that's the ball. So that Petsky character is part of that program name. That's kind of handy um, if you think about ways that you can use that to create a interesting directory of your programming. Let's go ahead and list this. You'll see now that we have, first of all, we're going to clear the screen. We're familiar with that command. Then we're going to print a space. We're going to print our ball. And then this one is going to move back a character. So it's going to actually overwrite the character after it prints it. And then it's gonna go here, we're gonna pause for a little bit, we're gonna to go to 20 and it's gonna go back up here and do that again. So keep that in mind, think about what those lines are doing and let's run this and see what happens. And you'll see the ball moves across the screen. Now what's gonna happen at the end? This is one that takes into account the end of the screen and it will just keep on moving all the way down. And it just keeps on going and going because if you remember in our program, this is 40 goes to 20 and it just keeps on going. You probably are curious what happens when it gets to the end. 
yeah, okay, I'll show you what it looks like, but let's let's speed it up significantly here. Let's change this from 50 to five and let's run it and see what happens. And this is gonna take a while. It's gonna go all the way across the screen. Here we go. That's actually pretty fast. I'm curious myself, what will happen when the ball reaches the bottom? Can you predict? I'd love to say I've already done this. I haven't. I'm ad-libbing. And there we go. That's what I anticipated. It's just going to stay on the bottom because what's happening is it's just constantly pushing everything above it up a screen. So that is our move ball program. Okay, now we've been playing with animations, but unfortunately the character has just been uh, uh, the color black. And what we want to do now is we want to add some life or color to our character animations by learning how to use the color command. Now we talked about colors way back in chapter four. If you go back to chapter four, which I encourage you to go back and check out some of those earlier chapters in the user's manual, you'll notice that within print commands, we can set colors. Well, what we didn't cover was how do you set colors of things like the background or how do you use multicolor mode? Well, we're gonna talk about that now in this section called controlling colors. And I'm gonna do that by first resetting my plus four, 32768. I'm trying to learn that in my memory. So now we're back to the beginning and I'm gonna use a color command that is color, which is a command built into Commodore Basic 3.5. Earlier Commodore 8-bit computers didn't have these. I believe the Plus 4 series and the uh, 128 were the first to have the color commands. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below. I know you will. Thank you for that. And let's go ahead and what we're going to do is color 4, 3. So if I do that, you'll notice that my border changed colors. It's now, it's supposed to be red. It's not quite red. You use the command color and then this first number here is what we're changing the color of. There's zero for background, one for a character, two for multicolor one, three for multicolor two, and then four means you're going to change your border. So here you see that we're changing the border. The next value is the color and we have colors one through 16. I do have a whole table with all of these colors in the companion blog post. Quickly, color three is red. So this command will change the border to red. Now you're probably saying to yourself, boy, that sure doesn't look very red. It looks kind of pink. Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's do another one first. Let's do color zero comma seven. Now, if you remember what I said, zero is the background. So we're gonna change the background. So we have a red border. Now our color zero is gonna change the background to seven, which is blue. Huh, this should be good, let's try it. So now we have our red border with our blue background. But again, they look more like purple and pink. Well, there is another value that can come after those commands. So let's go back up here. Let's change this to four comma three. So we're gonna change our border. We're gonna change it to red, and I'm gonna add one more variable, and this is your luminance variable. This will specify how dark a color is, and it goes from zero the darkest to seven the brightest. So I want this to be dark, so I'm gonna change it to zero. Now watch what happens to my border. Now it looks more red, that's a red border. If I go to this one right here and I'm gonna change my background, let's go ahead and change that to zero and see what that looks like. Now I fear this is gonna make this really hard to see because this is gonna be a really dark blue, let's try it. Let's change our character color. We know how to do that, so let's do color and let's do one. That's our character and we're gonna make that white and let's make that the brightest we can. It's not zero, it's seven, Steven, there we go. And let's list. And you can see our program. And now we have a red, white, and blue screen. We've got uh, everything for patriotic colors on our Commodore computer. Uh, let's go ahead and deload uh, one of our programs here. And you'll now be able to see the code. Now what happens if I run it? Well, I've not set any color codes in there, so it's going to keep that color palette unless or until I change it within a program. Okay, wouldn't it be nice if we could display all of the colors on the screen at once that are available on the plus four? Well, luckily in the user's manual, there is a program for just that purpose, although it was wrong. There were many errors. I finally troubleshooted through, tr troubleshooted, is that a thing, or bug checked uh, the program and figured out what was going on with it and why it wasn't working. So I think I have a working program. Let's go ahead and load it up here. And this is 07, this is color palette. 
and the program will load the entire color palette, all of the colors that are available on the plus four. Let's go ahead and list it first so you can see what it looks like. So first of all, up here, it is going to print the screen or clear the screen. We're gonna use some color commands along with some four next loops to inject specific numbers or a series of numbers into our color command down in line 70. You'll see that color one is going to also ask for a value from A. A is being established here in read A, which jumps down and grabs these values down here. And then it will also grab the value of M, which is in this loop up here from zero to seven. So through that process, it's going to create a double space that has been reversed that is created from the color that is being established in this command here in line 70. And it'll just keep going back and forth through this process until it prints. All of the colors are available on the plus four on our screen. Now again, there were some errors with this. Hopefully, keep those fingers crossed. I fixed this and it's going to work. Let's run it. And there you go. You see we get this nice background, a little darker background to make those colors pop. And if we scroll up here, you can see that we have this range of blues all the way from a color luminance of very high to very dark. And then we just kind of go across the screen and you get to see all the colors that are available here all the way to the end to where we get a grayscale pattern. So that is our color palette program. All right, let's have more fun with graphics mode. And we're going to use something called high resolution graphics. The plus four screen contains 25 rows of 40 characters each for a total of, do the math, 1,000 characters or 25 times 40 is 1,000. Each character is described by a grid of eight by eight pixels. So that means each character is eight times eight, 64 pixels. Therefore, the screen resolution of a plus four screen is 320 by 200 or 64,000 pixels. Now that's pretty low res in today's world. However, in its day, that was a pretty nice resolution screen, especially for an eight bit computer. So far we've controlled each eight by eight grid only. In this section, we will break that grid into the large screen and control all pixels individually to access something called high resolution graphics mode. While you may be thinking, hey, that sounds pretty cool. I can use a single color now for each pixel. You can't. The plus four will only allow you to access two colors per eight by eight character in this one mode. Now we are gonna look at a mode later that lets us use up to four colors within that grid. So keep that in mind, but for now, let's use our first multicolor graphics mode. And if you remember when I was describing the color command, I mentioned multicolor mode one, multicolor mode two. Well, now we're going to use one of those modes. And we're gonna do that, first of all, by loading a program I have called graphics program. Wow, how creative is that, huh? So let's go ahead and deload 07 graphics. We'll load that up here. We will list that. And what this is going to do is break our screen into a series of grids so that we can see how color, when it overlaps each other, affects the screen. Now remember, in the mode I'm using, we only have access to two colors in the eight by eight grid. We have the background color and we have the character color, that's it. So as we run the program, notice what happens as lines draw across the screen and then overlap other lines Notice the colors at those areas. Let's give this a shot. So you can see, especially in that upper left-hand corner where it changes and it tries to intersect where you see these, these little tick marks. And that is showing us those areas where when we overlap, it can't really uh, put both of those characters within that same eight by eight grid. So if we come back up here, you can see we're using the color command. We're changing in this case, we are changing the background color. We're gonna change that to black. We're gonna come down to our graphics command and we're going to enter our multi-graphics mode. So graphic one comma one is entering that multi-color graphic mode. 
you'll see that we have a color command here that's changing color. And then we're using the draw command to draw a series of pixels across the screen or up and down. And that's what these two are doing. We have our next, which will uh, cycle back through our for loop. We come down, we have a little bit of a pause here. Or if we want to go faster, we can change that. We'll do that here in a minute. We change our color out after a little bit. And then we come back to graphic zero, which gives us back our regular text screen. Without that, uh, we would have to figure out where we are in the program because that high res mode is just going to stay on the screen all the time. So this gets us out of it and back to our text screen. So if we go back to line 80 here, what you'll notice is that it's just counting for a while before it returns us back to that graphics mode. So let's just go ahead and run it again. And uh, I'm just going to make that a little bit shorter. We don't need all that time. And you'll get a chance to watch this run again. And it'll just be faster uh, before it breaks back into text mode for us. You can start to see kind of the limitation of the plus four when we're in graphics mode, it takes a while to create that image. And you know, modern day computers would produce that image just like this. So that is our graphics program. Let's use the graphic command and play a little bit more with high res mode. First thing I'm going to do is run our graphics program. So let me go ahead and get that on the screen for us. And you'll see that it's going through and drawing our lines again in high res mode. And now what I'm going to do is type in graphic two comma zero. Now let's talk about that command graphic. And I know, understand it's a little hard to see. I could, probably should have changed colors, but I'll keep it the way it is right now. But what's going to happen is graphic two changes to high res plus text mode. And then the zero says, don't clear my high res screen. Now, what you may be thinking is it looks like the high res screen has already been cleared. It's not. It's still there. It's in memory. High res, that high res screen that we saw with all those vertical and horizontal lines is still there, as is evidenced when I press return. And you'll see that everything is up at the top right now, and I have lines of text at the bottom. Now, this is uh, hard to see, so I'm going to type color 0, 2, and let's do color 1, 1. And you'll see that I have that. It's almost like a little terminal window underneath my graphics mode, if we were to look, uh, think about it in a, in a modern setting, right? Uh, but again, that high res mode is still in there. And now I have this little lower area where I can play around and use that high res area as kind of like a little graphic playground for commands. And we're going to take advantage of that here in just a little bit. But let me go ahead and talk about the graphic command one more time. The graphic command has five options. If I type in graphic, we have zero through four. Zero is text only. So if I type in graphic zero, you'll see that brings back just my text screen. If I type in graphic one, that goes into high res mode. Um, and I'm not going to do that. Well, let's try it. Okay. So that brings back that entire screen. But again, I can't see what I'm typing. So now what I've got to do is try and type graphic. Hopefully I get it right. And we're going to go graphic mode two, which is high res plus text. We hit enter. And there we go. Then we get our bottom back. So again, we can kind of bounce around. Now there, there is another one. And that is graphic mode three. And I've not really done anything in there, but let's go ahead and type it and see what happens. And you'll see there, it brings up this other screen. Now, that is what's known as our multicolor screen. There's also, and again, I have to type this blindly, graphic, and I'm going to type mode four, and that gives us our multicolor mode plus our text mode. So that's how you can bounce a row around into those modes. Now, remember, the difference between high res mode and multicolor mode is, High res mode gives you two colors, the background and character color per eight by eight pixel or eight by eight character. And the multicolor mode gives you four, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now there is an option on the graphic command I didn't cover. For instance, right here, we are in graphic mode four, which is, as I mentioned, that is multicolor plus text. If I add to the very end of this, a zero, which is the default, it won't clear that screen. So let me go ahead and show you what that looks like. So it just leaves the uh, multicolor screen intact. But if I change graphic four to a one, one means to clear the screen. So if I hit one, it clears the screen. So this is a way you can clear the screen, try some new commands and, and work with it over. Let's go ahead and do graphic and uh, let's bring up high res and text. 
And you see that there. If I want to clear that screen, I can come in here and do a one and that clears out that screen. And again, uh, remember that zero and one at the end of graphic, either zero doesn't clear the screen or one does clear the screen. So it's similar to text mode, this command, but for graphics. What we're gonna do now is we're going to play around with points, lines, and labels. Uh, so we're gonna draw some points, we're gonna draw some lines, and we're gonna use high res mode to do this. Let's go ahead and type graphic, and I'm gonna type two comma one. That should remind you of the graphics mode that we're going to be in. Think about what we talked about previously. And then I'm gonna do a colon right here, and I'm gonna do a draw command, which is one comma zero comma zero. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter. Let's see what happens. So when I do that, you'll notice that I am now in my uh, high res graphics mode with text. So I've got those five lines down at the bottom, but look up there in that upper left-hand corner. You see that little black dot? You may have to zoom in. You may have to get closer to your TV, but there's a little black dot. So what I've done is entered a command that will create that dot, but allow me to continue to draw on that graphics mode up above. And that's where it really becomes fun because now we're actually in immediate mode drawing on the screen live using draw command. And let's try another one so you can see what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna do draw one comma one comma one. Let's talk about that draw command. This means I'm going to draw. If that were a zero, that would mean it would erase or fill it in with the background color. This is a coordinate one comma one. Now we've already drawn something at zero zero. So this is going to connect a new point or line, depending on what comes next, right? To that other dot that was just there. And then what I'm going to do next is come over here and say, eh, let's draw that to 100 comma 100. So again, I'm using my command prompt, so to speak down here, my text area and watch what happens when I hit enter. Now I've drawn a line. You'll notice this, the screen scrolls because I've got those five lines of code that I can use or those five lines of text and I've drawn and I can continue to draw from that space. So what I'm gonna do now is draw one, two, 150 comma 50. Now this will in theory, remember where the last point was that I plotted and draw another line from that point to 150 comma 50. And you'll see that it draws that straight up. Now, what if we want to finish our triangle, complete our triangle out? Well, now what we can do is type draw one, two, zero, comma, zero, and that will complete our triangle. Now, if we, we, we can fill the triangle. There's a command for that, but hold that thought. We will come back to that. So that's the way that we can use immediate mode to draw in graphics mode two. You could also use graphics mode three and four for this as well. Uh, but remember, if you don't get the right graphics mode, you're not gonna have that line of text at the bottom and you'll be typing aimlessly. So remember to get the right graphics mode. The table for that is in the companion blog post if you can't remember, as well as in the user's manual if you're following along in the user's manual. Now what we wanna do is we wanna do some programming that utilizes our high res screen. And the first thing we're going to do is use a little math. We're going to construct a sine wave. So let me go ahead and load this from our companion disk. And it's loaded. Let me go back into graphic zero here. And remember graphic zero is our text so that we can see everything. Let's list our program, here's our program. And what we're going to do is we are going to work through our code here. We're gonna change our color of our background of our text. We're gonna move into graphics mode one. Uh, uh, and, and that, remember graphics mode one isn't gonna have text at the bottom. We're gonna locate a point. We're gonna do a for next loop as you can see here. We're gonna come in and establish some values for X. Then we're going to plot those values in a sine wave using our mathematical formula for that. And then we're gonna come down here, we're gonna pause for a little bit while we display it on the screen, then we're gonna come down here and we're gonna exit out of that screen. Now, but if you remember, when it exits, it, it exits that program, it doesn't really go away. We can go back and take a look at it. Let's go here and let's run our program and see what happens. And you can see it's taking a while to plot this. This is in real time, there's no delayed 
added. Um, this is real-time 8-bit computer actually emulated on Vice, but again, an accurately emulated clock speed. And that's gonna pause for a little bit and then it should break us back out into text mode. There we go. Now I'm going to go ahead and list this and I'm going to change that. We're not gonna wait that long for our break. Come in here. And uh, now remember that I said earlier that uh, that graphic is still in there. So let's go to graphic two, graphic mode two. And there we go. You can still see our sine wave, but now we have our text below so that we can uh, see the results of our along with our code if we want to do that. Let's go ahead and run this one more time. So this is creating the sine wave using a series of lines. We could modify line 70 such that it doesn't draw lines, but it creates a sine, wi sine wave via a series of dots. Because if you look here, this is creating a line from the previous line created to the next line. But if I come back here and I change this to this and hit enter, now when I run the program, watch what happens. It's going to create that sine wave with a series of dots. So it's not gonna connect the new line with the previous line. It's just gonna plot each of those points as a dot. That's kind of cool. I kind of like that. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna, I like that, that version better. So I think I'm gonna keep that in memory as we continue on to the next sec section. Now that sign graph by itself is pretty cool, but what if we added some code so that we could plot characters on top of that graph? Not, not just show the graph, but also have characters. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a bit of code to our current code. Okay, so you'll see I've typed in some code here, actually pasted some code, how cool is that? And now I'm going to run this again and let's see the results. Okay, and it's about to end, and afterwards it should put some text and our X, Y axis on there. How cool of that is that? It'll wait a little bit of time and then it will exit out of that. So as you can see, not only can we include graphics on a screen, high-res graphics, but we can include text on top of those high-res graphics. This is a great example of how to do that. I would encourage you to come in here and take a look at this program uh, in the companion blog post, but also on the companion disc. But you notice that we're doing that with this command here, this character command. And what it's doing is drawing a character at these coordinates, and then it's placing these characters at those coordinates. And then you'll see we pop down, we do it again. We're also using this command here to draw uh, an axis for us. Uh, and then we have another axis that's drawn later. So again, that is combining high-res graphics and text on the same screen. Okay, now we have drawn lines and dots. Let's do something else. Let's draw squares, circles, polygons, and learn. let's learn how to paint. Yes, you can actually paint with your plus four, but that's actually, paint is really just filling in those polygons. You remember that triangle I said later we'd learn how to fill that in? Now we're going to do that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reset my computer here and I'm going to uh, use graphics mode and we're going to play around again in immediate mode. So let's type in graphic two comma one. And then the next thing I'm going to do, you notice that it showed that screen, but I've cleared that. So it's a, it's a fresh sc uh, screen now. So now I'm going to do 20 box 1, 0, 0, 100, 100. And unlike the line command, there's no 2 for this. What we're doing is we are drawing, 1 is draw, from 0, 0, that coordinate, to the opposite corner, 100 comma 100. Now, if I've done that right, it should draw a square on the screen when I run the program. Let's uh, go ahead and run that. So that's how you can create a square. Now again, it doesn't look very square. It looks more like a rectangle and we will talk about that later. Now I'm gonna use that uh, graphics mode. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in graphic two comma one and let's list. So now we have that in. Now we can play around a little bit with this uh, text area. Let's go ahead and draw a rectangle. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to come up here to uh, my box command, and instead of 100 by 100, I am going to plug in 150 by 100. And if we run that, you'll see it creates now a rectangle. So let's go back and look at that command. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and change that back to 100 by 100 for now. And the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to come over here and add 45 to the end of my square. I'm also going to add a line 30 that is going to draw at 
50 comma 50 a single point. And uh, you'll see why I've done that here when I run the program. Let's go ahead and run. And you'll notice that I've plotted a point to show the rotation. This command, uh, line 20, adding the 45, rotates the box or the polygon the square, whatever shape it is, at 45 degrees about its center. And I've plotted that center point here so you could see that with a, just a single dot. Okay, let's do something a little different now. And I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this 45 degrees. Uh, I'm gonna get rid of my center point here. And I'm also going to use a new command. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and clear this out right here. To get rid of that, I'm going to go back up to my box command and remember we have, we're going to draw a box from 0 comma 0 to 100 and then what I'm going to do is put a comma. Now normally what would go here was that ro is that rotation value if you remember. So I'm going to add another comma to skip that which says don't do anything. It's basically putting a 0 in there. And then I'm going to add one other variable at the end, a 1 and I'm going to hit enter. Now watch what happens when I run this program and I think you'll understand what that one does now. As you can see, it's defined that area. The one at the end is actually going to fill in that box for us. So that's how you can fill a box that you've created. So if we go ahead and list that again, would it work if we added a 45? Could we rotate it and fill? Well, there's only one way to answer that question and that is to try it. So let's run it and see what happens. And you can see it can figure out that fill even at angles. That's pretty powerful, that's pretty uh, interesting. Okay, now let's use our box command to do some fun things with our high res screen. And the first one we're going to do is simulate a spirograph. A spirograph is an old drawing game tool thing. Those whirls and curly cues and clouds of color Spirograph, the miracle drawing set that lets you make a million marvelous designs. So here's the program right here for the Spirograph. I've already loaded it up from the companion disc. You'll notice as I look up here, we do some of the color commands that we're already familiar with. We change the graphics mode to, uh, and then we have now, uh, one of the first times we've seen the random, the use of the random uh, generator to randomly create a number that is going to draw a box that is going to rotate randomly around the screen and again, simulate a spirograph. And you'll see here's that box again, it does have L in here, which is a rotation value. It's going to step through that here, as you can see at random, very at a random value from here. So it's going to go from zero to 359 box draws at random rotations in around a circular area. And then you'll see our next L going back. You'll see four L equals uh, one to 2000. Again, that's a pause for us. And then it's going to clear the screen back so that we can see what has occurred. Let's go ahead and run this. This is the fun part. Let's just run it. So you can see how it's rotating around. And again, it looks a lot like a spirograph. It, it's not quite circular again, as, as we've said, but it's pretty close and it looks pretty cool. Now we're back to our regular mode. Let's do another one. And this is gonna use the box command to create something I like to call modern art. Now this is a unique program in that it does a couple of things for us. It not only creates some modern art, but it will also demonstrate how the plus four has that limit of as it's drawing, it can only have two colors in an eight by eight grid at the same time. So watch as it's drawing, you'll notice that when boxes start to overlap, sometimes the previous box, its colors get shifted because another box is being drawn on top of it and it can't share those colors within that graphics mode as we've talked about. So let's run it and see what happens. So you can watch as the green, hopefully the green will overlap. This is, this is all uh, done a little bit randomly, so we don't know where, there we go. You can see it t overtaking the color. But again, it's just kind of simulating uh, modern art for us, uh, and it's pretty fun to watch. Okay, I want you to notice a command in line five that's not a graphics command, it's not a color command, it's called the trap command. And you'll notice that it references trap 60. 60 is a line that will exit gracefully out of the graphics mode back into text mode. So let me talk about what happens here. Trap intercepts errors in programming conditions. And it does it in such a way that the program won't terminate if it notices an error. Instead of terminating, it will jump down to 60 when it notes that error 
and gracefully exit instead of just giving us an error. How will we know where the error occurred? Trap will register the line number where that error happened and place it in a variable called EL. So you could print EL and it will tell you which line had the error. That's pretty cool. A lot of people use this to help troubleshoot their programs. And you can think of it in line five as kind of a go-to command for what's being used here. The modern art program will continue to cycle until a run stop is hit. Then it will go to line 60 and gracefully exit out of there. Run stop would normally just terminate the program and give you a, a message, right? An error message, not necessarily an error message, but a run stop message. Well, this will take that, trap that, and exit gracefully. So I just wanted to point that out. It is neat that they've kind of um, included that here. It's not so neat that they really didn't explain it well. You would have to go back to the encyclopedia and hopefully I've explained it well. And if there are programmers out there who would like to explain it in a different way, feel free to do that down in the comments below or uh, in the comments at the companion blog post. Okay, the other thing I like about this program is not only does it have the trap command, but we also have our first chance to define a function. Here's our function, fna, and with the variable x. That is defined as the integer of a random number times one times x, which is that value that would be entered here as part of the function. It's used down here in line 30. You can see that it would be function 15. So if we go back up here, 15 would be that x variable. We would plug that in up here. It would complete that calculation of the function and then add one. And then you can see down here, we create a box with that same function accessed again for a variable at 320, 160, 320, and 160. And then that, that is modified based on this calculation here. Uh, let's see if we can simulate that error trapping as we watch the function create our modern art. Okay, so I've hit run stop and it exited out. You see that it cleared the screen and everything. So if I list, you'll see I still have a screen. Let's print EL and see, oops, EL and see where we exited the program. And it says we exited at line 40. So it registered my run stop key tap at line 40 and then trapped and exited it out gracefully. Let me go ahead and create a program here quickly. Let's do circle one. Remember one means to draw. We're gonna do it from 50 comma 50 to 25 comma 25. Let's talk about what's happening here. Of course, you know that one is to draw. If it were a zero, it would be to erase. This is your center point, 50 comma 50. 25 comma 25, think of that as your radius. Go from 50, 50 to 25, 25 from that center point, and then that is your new radius for your circle, and then we're gonna draw all the way around. So we're just basically plotting those two points, the center, the radius, and then it just knows to draw the circle from that calculation. So let me go ahead and hit enter here. Let's do another one though. Let's do 30, let's do circle, one comma 150, so we're gonna move over a little bit. Uh, 50 comma 25 comma 20. Now, I want you to note something here. Um, we've talked a lot in the past about our pixels not really creating the shapes we anticipate. So let me go ahead and run this. As you can see, the first one, if we look at our program right here, you see that mathematically, this should be the perfect circle, but the one on the left is not the perfect circle. It is kind of an ellipse, right? It's a squash circle. However, I did make some changes and I just made these visually kind of trying to figure out what would make a correct circle. And I changed it to where it's mathematically incorrect at 2520 and that gives me a perfect circle. The reason for that is because the eight by eight characters that we've been talking about. So let's take a look at what you're seeing on the screen right now. So I've got this screen up here, it's called Anatomy of a Commodore 8-Bit Character. If you look on the left, you see an eight by eight character, you'll notice that the pixel shape is not square, but it is rectangular. You compare that to what a square should like and you can see it's, it's pretty squashed. That's what's causing all of the distortion in our programs when we're drawing. Now, interestingly enough, this is kind of unique to NTSC video format, the format found in North America. If you try and do these same things on a PAL machine, uh, you get kind of a different result. So what I'm gonna do is try 
and simulate that for you now. So as we come back to my screen here, this is an NTSC. I'm going to, this is where the vice emulator really comes in handy. I'm gonna change my vice emulator settings and you can't see me doing this but I am going to change the machine from not an NTSC, but a PAL plus four. Now you'll notice immediately that everything kind of squashed, right? It went this way. Now one of the first things you'll notice is that the text is actually not as tall and actually your C is even a little bit more round than what it was uh, when I was in NTSC mode. So there you go. Now you can see that that line that before gave me a distorted ellipse is now a circle. It looks proper. So I guess my PAL version friends across the pond, uh, this didn't bother them as much as it did for NTSC. And it also explains why uh, a lot of software that maybe you were playing that was from one geographic region to the other may look a little different in screenshots from others. So what we're going to do is we are going to load a program called Shapes. And I really like this program because it really ex it explains the, uh, or, or demonstrates the power of the circle command. Let me go ahead and list this. So basically we have another program that goes, uh, again, changes graphic mode to two and one. Input says, how many sides do you want? And then we have some if then stuff going on here. If A is less than two, it can't be a, a shape, right? You can't make a shape out of just one or two, all right? Uh, you have to close it, it has to be at least a triangle. If it's greater than 100, that's way too much. And uh, it says, don't be ridiculous. But if you've successfully entered a value between three and 99, somewhere in there, it will create a circle with those values um, that doesn't create a circle, but creates a shape with the number of sides you've selected. So let's give this a shot so you can see what I'm talking about. So again, it's just a great demonstration of how you can use the circle command to create shapes. Let's just do three first for a triangle. And there we go, we have a equilateral triangle. It immediately jumps and says, what do you want next? Well, let's do four. Uh, so four lines in a circle, of course, is going to form a square and it rotates it, which is interesting. Let's do five. This will be interesting. There you go, there's our pentagon, a hexagon. How about a septagon? We get a septagon even, an octagon. A uh, nonagon, nonagon? <laughs> How about a tenagon? A decagon, of course. Oh, don't be ridiculous, can't do zero. So let's put in zero, there we go. And there you go. So we could just keep on going, but if you add too many, what you're gonna notice is it's just gonna start looking like a circle because as you fill it in with the low resolution of our plus four screen, it just looks like a circle. But this is a kind of a neat program. There you go, there's two. It should have errored out, I'm not sure. Why, so, oh, it just said less than two. So one, there we go, don't be ridiculous. And let's do 101 so you can see the other thing too. Don't be ridiculous. So there you go, there's how you can use the circle command to draw shapes. Interestingly, and I did not think about that it would do that, it'll draw a line. Check that out, it actually drew a line. I would not do that to draw lines. Okay, we've already done one spirograph simulator. Let's do another, spirograph two. Now introduces Super Spirograph. Bigger, more exciting, with a new assortment of snap-together pieces that let you make bigger, more fantastic designs than ever before. And this one, again, uh, does some, it uses the circle, and it's gonna draw a series of circles, actually not circles, actually ellipses, around the screen to reproduce, again, that kind of Spirograph simulation. So this is just another type of Spirograph. Let's go ahead and run it. And there you go. And then we've got a little bit of a pause before it will exit back out of that screen and we take a look at the code. Okay, let's take a look at that code and just kind of run through it here. As you can see up here, we're setting our colors in line 10 and 20. We set our graphic screen in line 30. We have here a random value and we multiply that random value by 20 and add 10. And then we have a four next loop here with a random step that is secured from up here with this variable. We draw the circle. We include L, which is coming here from this for next loop. We next L, we come down here, we wait 2000 after the end of the program and then we exit gracefully out of the program. So it's very similar to other programs we've looked at. And again, play around with the code can really yield some really fun results. So for instance, maybe you don't want that to be 10, you want that to be 20. And now we run it and just see what happens. And then you'll start to understand the code even more. 
and you can see that it's it's drawing them further away from each other. And again, it's it's a it's a spirograph. We've we've created an electronic spirograph that we can play around not with mechanical pieces and pencils and and uh, gears, but with math. It's really kind of fun to play with. Okay, and one more from the user's manual that we'll cover, and this is one called Circles, and uh, it's a pretty simple program. All it does is create circles on the screen using math to place those circles at strategic locations. It, it almost creates the Olympic symbol. It's one circle short of an Olympic symbol. So let's go ahead and list it here so you can take a look at it. Again, we have our information up here to set our graphic screen and our color. We have a for loop here, for next loop, one to four. That's the number of circles that are being created. Now here, uh, we're setting our Y value and then we're doing some calculations or some if thens. If L is a certain value or two, or it's equal to four, then Y is 100. So going through this and plugging in those values in will strategically locate circles for us. Let's go ahead and run this. And you see line 100, I guess I should say, just prints plus four circles. So let's run it so you can see it. Again, we're just kind of one circle short of a Olympic symbol. Now, can we change that? Let's see, if we go in here and list, let me go ahead and go back to graphic zero, go back to text mode. What if we were to go up here and change L from instead of one to four, one to five, would that get us our Olympic symbol? There's one, two, three, four, there you go. So now we have our Olympic symbol. So you can see that by using some code, we can easily draw specific types of symbols on the screen and make quick modifications. And uh, let's go ahead and change this back and just do three and do that one more time. So that's kind of fun. Okay, what we're gonna do is add three lines. And I've already added these into a program that is located on the companion disc. And I call it Venn because it looks like a Venn diagram. So if we list it now, you'll see that I've added three additional lines of code. We've added 110, 120, and 130. And this is a new command called paint. As long as we establish a paint point within a closed polygon or area, it will paint. If there's any break in that polygon, you can expect that paint command to exit out of that polygon and just keep going and it'll fill the entire screen. And it takes a while because it's a very slow computer. So let's go ahead and run this so you can see what happens. So first of all, it's gonna draw our four circles and then it's gonna fill in a couple of points within those circles. So that's how the paint command works. Again, we're establishing just some point within those closed areas and it fills it in. And again, it's kind of like a Venn. It's not quite a, a, a real Venn diagram, but it kind of reminds me of how you could use this program to create a Venn diagramming software or visual for a presentation. 8-bit presentations are still cool, by the way. Let's see if we can modify this to do our five and see what happens, see if it continues to paint within the same areas. So it's drawn circle one, circle two, circle three, circle four. Now it's gonna have that fifth one. What happens? And now you can see that it draws, it's smart enough to know to draw within those three different areas. So that's pretty cool. There's a neat way to really use the paint command again to paint in those areas. You know, the, the program in the user's manual originally had only four listed for the drawing of circles. I have to think this is an error. I think they probably wanted five. This is what they wanted, but as you saw, we got what we got previously with four, but I do believe that this was probably a error in the code. Okay, the last thing we have is multicolor graphics mode. We've probably been waiting for this whole last, however long this episode is. Boy, it is a long episode, isn't it? We're gonna talk about multicolor graphics. Remember, multicolor graphics allows us to do four colors per eight by eight grid. And instead of spending a lot of time talking about the programs, I just wanna demonstrate them. We may look at them briefly, but let's go ahead and bring up our first one and we'll load that. Let's go ahead and get back our graphic mode here. Let's list the program and you can see the program here. It's going to finally use that new graphics mode four, which again is uh, the uh, multicolor mode, not high res. Remember high res is different than multicolor. 
and then it's going to do a loop here from one to four. It's going to do some calculations about if and thens. We're going to go in here and uh, we're going to change our values of our colors to draw specific shapes, which are circles, as you'll see here. I have added a luminance value because when it drew these originally with the very faint colors, you really couldn't see the color, so I've changed that luminance. So when it draws a red circle, it's a red circle, not that pink circle. So I did change that, as you'll see. And then I've got these remark statements. So you'll see the changes to my code that I made. Uh, so it's a little bit different than what you will find in the user's manual. Again, for legibility and I think for ease on your eyes, too, so that you can see these colors. Let's run it and see what happens. This is our multicolor mode. Again, more colors per 8x8 grid. If you look, and, and I can't point easily, but if you look where those circles overlap, you'll see that we have now more than just two colors in a specific eight by eight grid. If you look where, for instance, the green circle is overlapping the red circle at either one of those points, you'll see that now we have black, green, and red all being displayed in those eight by eight grids. Let's go ahead and see if we can modify this and get our Olympic symbol back here. So let's not do for one to four. Let's go ahead and make that one to five again. Again, I think that was an error for some reason. I don't know why they did that. Let's run it. And let's see if we get our Olympic symbol. Now, this should really look like the Olympic symbol. This is going to be kind of cool. There we go. And you can see our different colors again, where it's overlapping and there's no break in the colors like we had with those horizontal and vertical lines. You can actually see the colors. Now, the last one we're going to do that demonstrates multicolor graphics is something called a neon sign program. And this one was uh, just a little uh, less impressive. I think the circles is more impressive if you're trying to demonstrate multicolor mode. Uh, but this one is on the, on the, in the user's manual and on the companion disc. Let's take a look at it. And maybe we'll modify it a little bit and see if we can make it better. Let's go back to graphic. You would think after typing these, I could type these pretty quickly. Let's list our new program. You see it here. And uh, you'll see that we're doing some drawing. And th the fun part is trying to figure out what it is drawing. Now, you could go and plot all those points. I'm not going to tell you. Uh, but we're going to display it here in just a minute. But this is supposed to simulate like a neon sign. It sort of does. It's kind of cool, though. Uh, in an 8-bit way, it's kind of cool. Let's run it. So here you go. You can see the high is flashing. Now, what's interesting on this is it's using more than one color or two colors. It's using all four colors to cause that fade in effect. So that is pretty cool. And you could go back into this program, play around with it and try it and, and uh, maybe do your own. We could change our color to something else. Let's try, um, let's change this to red. Let's see if that gives us something a little more stunning. There we go. So changing it to red, you can see that that really gets, I think that makes it look even more neon. What if, I think we have an orange, which is nine, if I'm not mistaken. Let's go ahead and change that to nine and see if that looks even more like a neon sign. Yeah, now see, I like that. So again, playing around with the program and playing around with colors, you can get a more dramatic result. And that's it for chapter seven. That was a long chapter. Let's check our checklist over here. Did we get everything done? Graphics, characters, animation, colors, yeah, points, lines, character, drawing circles, rectangles, paint command, multicolor graphics. We got it all in chapter seven. In chapter seven, again, I'm sorry it took a while to get this one out. I do hope that you are enjoying the series. I know this one was, uh, again, quite some time out from the rest of them. I'll try and do better with the next one. But honestly, this took a while. It took me a lot of time to type these in. And again, remember the companion blog post is your friend. The disc image is your friend. It's a lot of fun just to load those and play with them. Next chapter is chapter eight, making sound and music on the plus four. I'm looking forward to that. Imagine adding uh, graphics and color to creating sound. That's a blast. And now we're talking games and other great presentations. Then finally, chapter eight is the last chapter. And it's really interesting because in the book, if you look, 
here's chapters one through eight. And then look, here's all the stuff at the back because what's after that is our encyclopedia. So I am just, just trying now to decide how I want to cover the encyclopedia information. I'm obviously not going to go through every command, but I think I might uh, have some uh, a look through there and see if there are some things I want to share. I will say I am uh, interested in spending some time in the monitor, the assembler monitor. So we probably will do that. I am also really interested in the programs in the back of the book for you to try. And I want to make sure that those are all on the companion disc because my goal is that companion disc is the disc that should have been included with this user's manual. So with that, I hope you enjoyed a chapter seven of the Commodore Plus 4 user's manual using graphics in color. And at this time, Retrocombs out.